We went to Ashburton, as I have said a while ago, last week via airplane, and we've experienced the most violent flight in our lives so far. Yes. Have you experienced that violent uh, flight when you were about to land? We experienced that. My goodness. I think maybe one meter dropping from, oh my goodness. I could just, I, yes, we felt the butterflies in our tummy. I, I remember Mako just crack, laughing and laughing. And because of what happened, there's so, there's so much butterflies inside our tummy because of that experience. But actually, I wasn't really scared. It's just that I felt the butterfly just like tingling in my, in my, inside my body. But I wasn't really worried about it. You know why? Because I fully trust the pilot. I know the pilot knows he knew what he's doing. And I fully trust him. I have so much confidence with the pilot. Yeah. I was actually confident with the pilot. All of us here experience flying through airplane, right? Who experience flying airplane? Because you are here, I know, and maybe the Kiwis, I don't know if you experience troubling other uh, place, but all of us, many of us experience it. But you know, when you step in that plane, you don't ask, should this plane crash? You don't, we don't feel that way, right? Why? Why? Because you are confident that the pilot knows what he's doing. You know what? It's good to know. And it's good to put our confidence on someone who knows what he is doing. And he knows how to bring you to your destination. Isn't that great? You know, when you enter the plane, you don't ask, oh, you, you don't feel nervous, oh, this plane might crash. No. You just sit there, buckle up, relax, wait for the flight. That's it. You don't have to be worried about it because... You have confidence. You didn't realize that you are putting your confidence on the pilot. But today, church, I would like, church visitors, members, I would like to talk about putting our confidence on someone who really, who perfectly knows actually what he's doing and where we are going. So you know where I'm going right now, right? I would like to establish this fact, this truth, that we are going to put our confidence on the one who knows everything. It's good to, have put, it's good to put your confidence in someone, right? Friend? Of course, yes. To your spouse. Or maybe to your parents. It's good to put confidence on them. Or maybe your leaders, your pastors. But all these people that I mentioned, they are imperfect people. That's why today, I would like to talk about this message that says, confidence in God. Who would like to put their confidence in God right now? I would like to start up with verse 14. Let's read it says something like this, For this reason, I kneel before the Lord. There's so much confidence in this phrase. Paul mentioned this. Paul wrote this in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14. There's so much confidence in this word. For this reason, I kneel before the Lord. There's so much confidence to bow down on on his knees, Paul was writing this letter. To bow down on his knees, it's a sign of utmost humility and submission. You won't submit, you won't uh, humble yourself to someone whom you don't know, whom you don't have any confidence, but Paul knew who God is. He said, I, for this reason, he had a reason why he knelt down. If you would go back, of course, it says for this reason, meaning to say he had a reason from the previous verses or previous chapter. If you go back to chapter 2 of Ephesians, 
If you have your Bibles with you, and you put it here, but you could go there later on, just review the chapter 2. If you have your Bibles right now on your hand, please just follow me. In verse 4, it says of Ephesians chapter 2, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even we we are dead in our transgression. Meaning, God, who was rich in mercy, made us alive. Why? Because before we were dead in our transgressions. That's one of the reasons why Paul knelt before the Father, God the Father. God raised us up with Christ and seated us with the heavenly realms. In verse 6 and verse 8 it says, For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. You have been saved from where? From the death, from the penalty of death, from the penalty of sin, which is death. You are saved from that penalty. That's one another reason why Paul had so much confidence with God. In verse 18, let's continue in chapter 2 of Ephesians. 13, sorry. Once we were far away from God, have been brought near By the blood of Christ, we were far away from God before. But because of the blood of Jesus, we were brought near to Jesus. That's how good God is. In verse 18, for through Him, we both have access to to the Father by one Spirit. Before, we don't have any access. We don't have any right to come to God. But when Jesus Christ died for you, for you, for all of us here... We had an access. We have an access right here, right now. In verse 19, Consequently, you are no longer foreigner and strangers. Before, we used to be strangers. We used to be foreigners in the sight of God. That when Jesus Christ died for you and for me, you became a member of His family. In verse 22, And in Him, you two are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by His Spirit. You, have, you, have, you talk too much, Pastor June. What I'm saying here, that God is good. God is so merciful. You were, dead in, you, were dead to, you were dead to sin before, but God made you alive in Christ. I'm just trying to summarize what I have said today. I would like to solidify your confidence in God. I will give you the reason why you need to put your confidence in Jesus Christ. And after this message, I would like you to boldly say, For this reason... For this reason, I kneel before the Father. For this reason, I will follow God. For After this service, I would like you to say this boldly. For this reason, I will listen to you, God. For this reason, I will surrender to you, God. For this reason, I will follow you, God. Isn't that great? That we have this confidence in the God who, made the, who created the heavens and the earth. And I'll give you the reason why you can kneel down. Why you can follow God. Why you can surrender everything to God today. Because my confidence is in God. You would put your confidence in God. First point that I'm going to tell you. Of course in verse 15. God a Father. There you are. Can you please help me here? Hmm. There. So for this reason, I kneel before the Lord. There's so much confidence on this verse. I'm so... There. In verse 15 it says, From whom every family in heaven and on earth derives. God the Father knows you. I'm speaking about the, the Trinity of the Triune God here. First, co- having confidence with God, you have to put your confidence not only in God the Father, but we are going to put our confidence in God the Son, who is that? Jesus Christ. And the third one is God the Spirit. But it not on that order. We're going to put our confidence in God the Father, then God the Spirit, and God the Son. First, it says here in verse 15, For this reason, I kneel before the Lord, before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. This verse tells me that God the Father knows you, knows us. He even knows your family name. 
He even knows your name. According to this verse, that's the prayer of Paul for the Ephesian church. That he would strengthen you. Sorry, that's not... <laughs> uh, can you go back one, uh, one slide, please? And then, sorry for technical problem. Yeah. One slide, please. Yes. All right. There. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name. This verse tells us that God knows. Your family, even your family name, because our family name, the family in heaven and on earth derives from God. That's why that's the confidence of Paul, because God knows everything. God knows our origin. God knows the plan for us. Actually, the father from the Greek word pater, pater actually, speaks of a supreme deity. He is responsible. When you say father during the time of the New Testament, he is responsible for the origin he is responsible for the plan and for the care of all the things that exist. God knows your origin. God knows His plan for you. God knows, knows everything and He even cares for you. That's the Father. Even the earthly Father, we have that instinct. The Father, our children, it, they originated from us. We have plans for our children. We care for our children, a good father. And God, he is good. And that's the attribute of our God. He's responsible for everything that exists. Can we put our confidence on that God who knows everything, who knows you, who knows your origin, who knows his plan for you, and he even cares for you? We have a God. We have a God who is so big, who is able, who is unlimited. The splendor of the universe. Look at the sky during the night. You would see the splendor of the heaven. Who, 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 who made that? Who created that? God. God the Father. How about the stars in the night? Can you count the stars in the night? Who can, who can count the stars up there? Can anyone count the stars? Anyone here? No. I think even you use all the highest, the, the high te- technology that they have today, we cannot count it. To give you an idea how many stars that our big God, who knows everything, how many, how many, uh, how, how massive the stars God created, to give you an idea, we are, the earth is, uh, we are in, a, in one galaxy. You know how many stars in one galaxy? 400 billion. That's only one galaxy. And we are on that galaxy, the earth. Around us, there are 400 billion stars. But you know what? how many galaxies we have in the universe? 400 billion galaxies. Who created that? That originated from God, the Father. Can you count that? I have here. I went to. I, I went to uh, to Eastern Beach. Who can count this one, please? So that after the service, please tell me how many. This is the sand. I went to Eastern Beach, and then I got my shovel and just put some here. And I. I this is exactly. Around 2.9 kgs. Can you count this for me, please? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> Every grain. Can you can you count this now? What do you think? What which is uh, who got a high? Which is more uh, in number, the stars in the heaven or this one? Stars. Are you sure? Are you sure? If I'm going to add another 1.7 kgs 
of sand of grain from Eastern Beach. So what do you think now? Still stars. You think there's no four billion here in Portugal, see, blah, blah, blah. Do you think stars still uh, higher than this one? Mm. Actually, I don't know. I don't know, but uh, one thing I know. Name one beach. Come on. Miami Beach, Howick Beach, Eastern Beach, Shelly Beach, Long Beach, Mission Beach, Mission Bay Beach. And you add up all the Sahara, the, the, all the deserts, Sahara deserts, all the deserts in the world, all the beaches in the world, combine them. All the sands, still, there are more stars than all the sands that we have in this earth. Can you imagine that? That's how powerful our God is. He made those stars in the universe. And listen to this. If you can count this one, and we would add all the beaches all over the world that God created, that we can even count. And there was one, uh, I googled it, you can count all the, 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 those things in how many days? Actually years. Uh, where is that? It's about 300 trillion years. Are you okay? Yeah. Uh, I think he's, uh, she's giving birth. God bless Jane, the name of Jesus. God bless you. So, include her in your prayer. You cannot, we cannot count it, right? It's about 633.7 trillion years to count all the stars in the universe. But Psalms 147 verse 4 says, God determines the number of the stars and he calls them each by name. All those stars got their names. God numbers them. God knows. If you are not satisfied with that, let's go to Isaiah. It's uh, Isaiah 426. It says, lift up your eyes and look to the heavens who created all this. He who brings out the starry hosts one by one calls for each of them by name because of his great power and mighty strength. No one of them is missing. That's why we should put confidence in this God. That's what he does to his children. He even knows your name, your family name. No one can snatch you away from God's hand. He knows your name. He perfectly knows you. If he could name every stars that we can even count. If he cares for these stars, how much more he would care for you. Family here are those who believe Jesus Christ and those who were redeemed, both who died and who are still alive, us, those who believe Jesus, he gave them the right to become his children, to be a part of the family. So do not complain and say that you are unimportant, neglected, and forgotten. If God cared for the stars, they numbered them. God knows you. There's only 7.5 billion people in this world. He knows exactly your name, your need. He knows exactly where you are right now, your pain, your struggles. God knows exactly what you're going through. So put your confidence in this God because God knows you. Not only that, if we would continue with our verse, it says that God, that God the Spirit, God the Father, God the Spirit, and God the Son, go to God the Spirit, empowers you. It says, I pray that out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit and inner being. Many, many people today lack, who lack confidence because of their weakness. Sometimes we don't have any confidence in our lives because we felt we are so weak. But children of God, children, who, those who put their faith in Jesus, you don't have to be weak. You don't have to be uh, weakling in the eyes of God because we have the Spirit in us. And that's the Spirit of God. 
And that's our confidence. We could go on, we could advance, we could do our thing in our church, in our ministry, in our family, at our workplace. We don't have to experience weakness. If you really believe that you have a God who could strengthen you, out of His glorious riches, He may strengthen you with power through His Spirit in your inner being. We need the power of the Spirit in order for us to survive in this world. We cannot do it by ourselves. Even it says in Zechariah, it says, it's not by might nor by power. It's not by your might nor by your power, but by the Spirit of God that would, would, would enable you to do mighty things, great things in this world. To be a great dad, to be a great mom, to be a great son, daughter, to be a great church member, to be a great pastor or leader, you need the power of the Holy Spirit that will strengthen your inner being. In Old Testament, if you're reading your Old Testament, Spirit was given to those people in order for them to achieve something. Gideon, he was given the Spirit of God in order for him to, to destroy the massive army with only, with having only with, with, uh, only with his only uh, 300 soldiers. In the New Testament, Jesus gave the Spirit to the apostles to guide them to be their advocate, to be their helper, to be their defender, to be their teacher, to be their leader. In Acts, in the book of Acts, the Holy Spirit was given in order for us to have the power to spread the gospel. If you don't have the power to spread the gospel, if you are shy about the gospel, sharing it to your mom, sharing it to your teacher, sharing it to your classmate, you need the Spirit, you need the power of the Spirit in order for you to share the good news to other people. And also in New Testament, we receive the Spirit in order for us to receive spiritual gifts. Gift of healing, gift of giving, gift of leadership, gift of administration, gift of teaching. Those are gifts. We need the Holy Spirit to empower us. You know what? We can be Christians, but still don't experience power. There are Christians Filled with the Spirit, they say, but they don't have power. Why? Because we don't have inner strength. We don't allow the Holy Spirit to strengthen our inner being. Do not be caught up in strengthening your outer being too much, to the point that you already neglected the more important thing, which is empowering, strengthening your inner being. We are, so much, we are spending so much time at gym, taking so many vitamins, all these things. But there's nothing wrong with those things. But don't forget to strengthen your inner being. You know what? How you're going to strengthen your inner being? Simple. Prayer. Pray. Because when you pray, you talk to God in spirit and He strengthens your inner being. Your spirit and the spirit of God connects. Just like you are a cell phone that is almost... Uh, running out of battery. You have to plug in. You have to connect in order for you to have a 100% full battery. You have to connect to the power source. And only prayer. You have to read the Word of God. Whereas though, Pastor John, I don't have the Word of God. You have the Word of God. Who got a cell phone here? If you have a cell phone, then you have a Word of God in your hand. Maybe Samsung, maybe iPhone, maybe Android. What have you? You have the Bible in your hand. We have all the luxury in this world. The Bible is already in our hands. Before in China and other places, they are struggling to have the Bible, the Word of God in their hands. They are being persecuted when, they, when, they, when, the, when the government finds out that they have a Bible, a Word of God in their house, in their pocket. But here we have so much freedom. The Bible... Is in our hands. You know, actually, how many Bibles you got in, the, in, your, in your iPhone? Thousands, even million Bibles. You could Google everything. Oh, just Google the Word of God. You know what? Because the Word of God would speak to your soul, to your mind, to your will, to your emotion. God will repress you. God will strengthen you. You need to strengthen your inner being. And when you hear the word of God through prayer, and when you hear the word of God through the word of God through the Bible, then obey it. That's true. That's the real power of God in you. If you, don't, if you cannot obey God with His word, then you don't have any strength. And when you obey God, even though it seems so impossible, even it seems it's a contradiction to the culture of this world, as long as it is written in the word of God, Obey it, because the Word of God is strengthening you. The prayer, your prayer is strengthening you. 
Now tell me, are you weak right now? Do you experience weakness right now in your Christian life? Then you have to rely. You have to put your confidence in God, the Spirit, who could empower you. Thirdly, we already finished God the Father and God the Spirit. Thirdly, God the Son. Who is God the Son? Jesus. God the Son loves you. I don't know with you, but I found this in this verse that Jesus really loves me so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted, established, in other translation it says, grounded in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how high, how wide, how long, how deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. What a kind of love that comes from God the Son. We long to be loved, right? Those people who lack of love, they, are, they feel uh, weak, they feel uh, unconfident, uncomfortable. But you know what? We people, we long to be accepted. We long to, be, we long to have this uh, self-importance. We, yes, we, we, I know that uh, sometimes we are being so selfish about that, but that's who we are, just the nature. We love, to be, we love to be belong, we love to be loved, we want that. This is our confidence. Jesus loves us. You think your friend or your spouse or your girlfriend, your boyfriend abandon you? Come on, I will never leave you nor forsake you, Jesus said, because he loves you. And this verse tells us how much Jesus loves us. But before we can appreciate or experience the love of God, we have to believe in Jesus Christ, and let Jesus Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Have faith in Jesus Christ, and Jesus Christ will dwell in you, and there the love of Christ will start to manifest in you. In John 15, 9, don't go there, I'll just read it to you. As the Father has loved me, it originated from the Father. Jesus Christ speaking here. As the Father has loved me, Jesus said, so have I loved you, Jesus Christ. So I have loved you, Jesus Christ. Love us because God the Father loved him. Now remain in my love. Jesus Christ said. So you have to remain in the love of God. Because God the Father loved Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ loves you. Being rooted in love means you have to stay strong in the love of Christ. You have to remain in Jesus in order for you to be rooted. Have you seen a tall tree rooted deeply on the ground? I don't know how, uh, uh, how strong the storm could take it down, but if you are rooted deeply in the love of God, no amount of storm in life can break you down, can put you down. That's why it says you have to be built and rooted in the love of God. Not only that, it says be established in other words, in other translations. It says grounded. I could see a, a ground a established or grounded in a concrete. If you, Jesus Christ is the stone, is the rock of our salvation. We have to be established. We have to be grounded in a solid ground. Our solid ground is Jesus Christ, the rock. If you are grounded, if you are established in a solid ground, who is Jesus Christ, with His love, no amount of earthquake, just like what happened to Kaikura or Wellington, could shake your foundation. That's the love of God. That's why when you experience the love of God, it would overflow in your life as the body of Christ, the body of believers, the Lord's holy people. That's why we have people here in this church serving. 
there at the back at the tech room. They serve him because of love. You see people shaking your hands when you enter that room. They're doing it because of the love of Christ in them. You would see our marshal, our parking people. Thank you. <laughs> you could see the parking marshal under the rain or under the heat of the sun, waiting for you, for you to be guided to the parking space, the parking lot. Why? Because of the love of God that's being manifested in their lives. The kitchen people, the kitchen hand, why they're doing it, I cannot understand. Why are these people spend, spending so much time in the church serving people without any pay? You know what? Yeah, we cannot understand, we cannot, we cannot, we cannot grasp how wide, how long, and how deep. The love of God in them, it, the love of God is being, exp- being expressed through these people. They are not being paid. Why they have to come here early on Sunday just to shake the hands of the people? To play the drums here, keyboard, practicing Saturday. Why? They are not being paid. That's the love of God. That's the love of Christ in their lives. Because God loves them and manifests through their lives. The next time you see our men uh, under the sun or under the rain, come on, smile at them while they're trafficking you, leading you to the right parking lot. Smile at them. Reprecate it. Give them the love. Our love for others starts from the love of Jesus. How wide? How long? How high? How deep? I cannot understand. I cannot grasp. It is unfathomable. It is immeasurable. 700 miles of the coast of Guam is the Mariana Trench, the deepest place in the ocean. On January 23, 1960, Jacques Picard and Donald were lowered into the cold, lonely darkness. Their descent into the deep Mariana Trench, which set the world record, has never been repeated. The depth of the ocean is mind-boggling. The Mariana Trench is nearly seven miles down. The water pressure at the bottom of the trench is 15,931 pounds per square inch. Imagine that. I can't imagine. I don't know what it means. You know what it means? 15,931 pounds per square inch. Sorry, I don't know that. But I cannot understand it. I cannot fathom it. Walls so plot fish on the ocean floor. In spite of that massive pressure, they found a flat fish on, on the ocean floor. Surviving despite the pressure and the darkness underneath. For most of us, it's hard to fathom, right? Just how deep the Mariana Trench is. But much more difficult to comprehend is the love of God. You may be under that Mariana Trench, under the darkest place. So much pressure in the life, in your life, under that dark, deep place of life. But one thing, you could remember that it says here that God loves you. Jesus Christ loves you. The reason we can never reach the depths of God's love is that it is infinite. It is infinite. Infinite. Just think about 318. It says, come on, many have power together with all the Lord's people to grasp how wide How long, how high, and how deep is the love of Christ? But God's love is deeper than the Mariana Trench. Therefore, I am going to put my full confidence on God who loves me. Finally, my last verse. Now to Him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to the power that is at work within you, within us, within me. That power is at work within us to Him who is able to do immeasurably. God is able, right? You may not be able, but God is able. God is able. I would like you to finish the sentence. God is able to? To give me a job. God is able to restore my relationship. God is able to restore my friendship. God is able to provide for my needs. 
God is able to heal me. God is able to lead me. God is able. I don't know. Just finish the praise. God is able. I don't know what's in your heart, what's in your life right now. Finish the praise. God is able. Now to Him who is able, remember, immeasurably, more than, more than, more than all we ask or imagine. You cannot imagine it. You cannot imagine it. Just ask about it. According to His power, and His power is at work within you. God wants to give you everything. There was a story of a young man. After he had an argument with his dad, he left home. He went to another city. And then after so many years, after 18 years, this man, he was grown up, he became a man. He was just there begging on the train, around the train. Begging for alms, begging for money. And then he, he called the attention of this man, this old man. Sir, sir, can you give me one dollar, please? And then when the old man turned around, he saw the man. And then the old man said to this man, I have, I have all my riches. It is for you, my son. I've been waiting for you 18 years. You're only asking for one dollar, but I would like to give you all what I've got. All my money in the bank, all my businesses, it's all yours, my son. I've been waiting for you 18 years. God is waiting for you for so long. How many years? God is waiting for you. Maybe one year, three years, four years, or twenty years, or for the whole of, whole of your life. God is waiting for you to come. Do not settle for little things. Do not settle for mediocrity. Settle for what is best. God wants to give you everything He is able to do immeasurably. More than all we asked. More than all we could imagine. According to the power that has worked within us. God is waiting for you. Put your confidence in God. If you lost your confidence in God, put it back. Put it back. Your confidence in God because God knows everything. God the Father knows you. God the Spirit will empower you to live the life that you have to live. God the Son loves you. Where would you put your confidence? I will disappoint you one day. Your spouse can disappoint you one night. But God the Father, He will never disappoint you. Put your confidence in the God who knows everything. And He would empower you and He would love you for the rest of your life. Amen.